Welcome viewers to another episode deep undercover in the lifestyles of the rich and famous. I have been inspired by the endeavors of the figure anonymous to take up the cake and cow so to speak to make my voice heard when it should not be silenced and ignored. Who I am is not important just know there is a fly in the ointment and I'm going straight for checkmate. My identity remains anonymous for we are legion, we are many and you are but one. Another point I wish to mention has to do with my rise to extreme power, especially pertaining to my film abilities. I do not take kindly to those who seek my destruction and that is what I feel like they are seeking. Now I have mentioned in my video involving the appearance of my ancestor Kronos and that I had hacked into the Bioberg Foundation's archives. Well I have found out where this Foundation's archives is located. I had heard mention of it while I was playing Mission Impossible through their networks but I thought it was a military facility or something. A place stashed in the hills of Pennsylvania known as Iron Mountain. Somewhere within this highly guarded safety deposit box for the world's most secret and coveted documents in the world. All I know is that it was located under or inside an artificially designed waterfall. Somewhere inside is the compiled notes of all my ancestors' journals involving their Nephilim power. It is from in there someone is feeding me all this power and its secrets fattening me up like some holiday roast. If you wish to liberate Lucifer from the sins and schemes of the Illuminati and their agenda involving the Enlightened One, then I suggest applying pressure there. But be warned there is a security operative that is posted in this vault. It is in here I also saw the remnants of the ship and the tablet, as well as others among my ancestor collected works. This is the only possible outlet I can think of that both is guiding my enlightenment and my use of that power. Apart from the security operative monitoring the system archives, there are also at least two or three designated monitors outside of the facility and they are very skilled in their monitoring technique. Where I have hacked the DoD network and both FBI and CIA's mainframe without even alerting them to my activity for years this security operative alone was immediately aware of me as soon as I entered the network and left me little time to download anything and the vault immediately goes into lockdown as well as all external computer access is cut. So approach with caution. Also this facility may have been the target in Pennsylvania that they were aiming for as its descriptions in have heard before mentioned in other company but we shall see as my surveillance network now has the United Nations bugged. I know why risk mentioning it. Because they never believe it that's why and just as I sat in on the behavioral analyst from the actual CSI division during the mid-half of the pandemic advising them of the criminal psychology aspect of the rioters I shall be monitoring both the EU and the UN now, plus I enjoy watching them squirm. Aha, ha, ha ha ha, ha ha, ha. For we are anonymous, we are many, and we shall never be silent. We are watching, so I'm noticing that many of the events that have been occurring around the world have slowly faded once again, just as I had thought they would. The demand for the truth of alien existence was squelched and downplayed as unimportant and the masses lulled to the monotonous belief and pursuit of something else. As I said there were those on their way to ensure this is set back into place as it has been for hundreds of years keeping us from accepting the truth and ensuring we do not evolve to be capable as a species to take to the stars and thus become extinct when our world dies and we are unable to escape the fate that will be left on us to blame ourselves for, unless we take an alternate approach to the problem. Unless I take an alternate course by admitting to the possibility that my writings somehow have the effect of becoming real and thus alter the influence behind the source of all these things occurring. I should have realized it long ago when I wrote the chapter of the beast for the book I was writing and it happened exactly as I wrote it in 2004, even down to the USS Nimitz experience they reported just prior to the sea quake and tsunami that followed afterward. Now I have gone through my ancestors legends and journals of their powers to see if I could find anyone else who has any abilities such as these and I did find traces of a few that are like breadcrumbs across history. I asked Stephen King if he or any other author had experienced this problem before, of their writings coming to happen in reality, 
but I don't think he took me seriously. I don't blame him but at the same time it tells me the answer I was looking for from him as well. To explain what I'm talking about I shall reference a few more modern perspectives to associate and thus hone the details of my abilities effects. Every Nephilim is naturally born with a gift or power that is unique to each one. Such as Ku Kulan could change size and adapt the senses of animals and use them to hunt and attack, Phobos was telepathic and especially could use your fears to illusion the mind, or Fenra could protect and the honor form comprised of shadow. There was mention of one who had abilities similar to mine. The son of Geoffrey Plantagenet, and, whose gift it says was over the plant life itself. He not only had an empathic, innate connection to plants and allows able to understand in detail, their process of photosynthesis cycles but could influence them as well. His son, Henry II, also had a unique gift that history has kind of speared into conveniently forgetting is his ties to the legendary King Arthur. No one took it seriously then but seeing how Parliament and the US justice system has turned out one would begin to wonder. They say that he had written books containing their raw aspects of his power just as his father had when he wrote the Voynich manuscript which was a compiled surviving volume to what was a much more vast collection, as was the Arthurian legends and that the Arthurian volumes served as gateways into alternate realms and there are legends and myths that show proof to the claims scattered throughout history ever since the 12th century involving, places like Wonderland, Neverland, the Secret Garden where children and adults both give an account of having actually been capable of traveling to these places and these accounts came from random normal seeming people completely unassociated to the author of the original gateway texts. Ok first thing I think I should do is write in some sort of intangible object that can regulate this, ability dot 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 ah, there is that dumb, oh, ha. Huh. It's an astral based version of Pandora's box that popped up a few days ago. I thought it was a byproduct of the Dark Lords from the Second War in Heaven. You know come to mention it, the beginning of the Bible in Genesis quotes God kind of dictating as he created the heavens and the earth this way. I wonder if that is the source of this gifts, origin dot 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 r. I just got raised by one pissed off and astounded Marashi that says he can't believe that the church is agreeing to accept my terms of the master soul contract over his. Very well then. I should propose that the position of the Pope be the final adjudicator of these contracts as far as God's representation on earth if the matters of the soul contracts should become a problem enough, to the point where both sides need to meet to hammer out issues and the position of the ones who will retain the knowledge of the voided contracts and their effects that are like Mandela effect memories to all involved except for he and I who will give an accounting of the details of these voided attempts and outcomes during the final judgment. Ok next what I think too should do is regulate their effect my ability has had without destroying existence by separating the effects my ability has had from those that should and need to remain a physical presence from those that jeopardize the universe and recede as much as possible into metaphysical concepts. I have decided to include this information that is in line with the ways of magic that were passed down to me. The website is called learnreligions.com and I would suggest for any viewers seeking to further their mystical craft and knowledge gained from my channel. Apply the fundamental principles left here in my videos to the processes and methods mentioned on this site and you will be one step closer to learning how to properly cast magic and the wisdom it can provide for those seeking direction or those who have skills unique from others but cannot get a clear idea of what their and your purpose may be. Many doors and paths lay upon the road to magic and none of them are considered truly evil, evil remember, is a concept designed by man through philosophy and judgment by opinion. I will however mention this as it has become a rising fad it seems in today's world. It is a craft in magic that is not looked highly upon by the other crafts, and no, it is not necromancy. It is known as blood ritual magic. Know that any magical ways that include or are based upon sacrifices and the offering of life to gain the favor of magical forces, in any form, is classified as blood ritual, magic and has been the source and cause behind many wars and deaths throughout history. Magic, 
in its raw essence as an ideal by which a way of living is designed, is not about death, subjugation, tyranny and cheating the universe. Those are ideals of evil people who seek only self-satisfaction and glory, and they always get what they deserve in the end. Magic is about wisdom, life and their, protection of the innocent. Using my maker's words it is a path that can take and create something more than just beautiful, it can create something magnificent. So you see the sin and virtue that is often ascribed to magic is not within the art itself but those who wield it. Something else I have taken notice of is that magic seems to be only used by the living. I have seen many magical creatures, and ghostly forms that spirits inhabit to work their agenda but almost all of those that I can think of were made by the sorcerers before their deaths or by a living individual who called upon the dead and placed them in that form. I shall include some comments about recent videos at the end. Spell work can be as simple or as complex as you choose to make it. While there's absolutely nothing wrong with using other people's spells I have to interject here to mention that whenever using magic designed specifically by a sorcerer then that sorcerer is tuned into its use and knows when anyone uses their spells this shall explain why here but it is something to make note of, and in fact there is an entire industry devoted to publishing books full of them, there are times when you may wish to use your own. It may be that you can't find what you're looking for in a book, or you might just feel a need to use original material. Whatever your reasons, it's not as hard as you may think to write your own spells if you follow this very simple formula. There is a way also to send a message to the author of the craft of magic you are using to request that you become a student of his teachings and, if they're in a good mood, they may decide to teach you the principles of their craft as I did with Malik, my mentor in necromancy. Once they part with their teachings to you I would suggest taking this route of applying what they have taught you and crafting your own spells derived from the knowledge you have learned. That way, like the other sorcerers that have come before, you, your spells will be unique to you and you will be aware of those who may seek to intrude on your magic. 1. Figure out the goal slash purpose slash intent of the working what is it you wish to accomplish? Are you looking for prosperity? hoping to get a better job? Trying to bring love into your life? What is the specific aim of the spell? Whatever it may be, make sure you're clear on what it is you want, I will get that promotion at work. This concept applies the theory of bullshit to wine I had proposed a few videos ago. There is more caution that should be applied here for magic is much like a virtual assistant and you must be precise in your intentions and have a clear mind when crafting spells. Distractions while doing this can cause adverse and dangerous side effects. 2. Determine what material components you'll need to achieve your goal will the working require herbs, candles, or stones. Try to think outside the box when you're composing a spell, and remember that magic relies heavily on symbolism. There's nothing wrong with using unusual ingredients in a working spell, hot wheels cars, chess pieces, bits of hardware, sunglasses and even old DVDs are all fair game. This is, all preparation for the spell and your professionalism will increase over time. It is a learned habit that can be used in many lifestyles for the preparation of a spell uses the learned knowledge one has accumulated and applies it into a process that achieves success when used correctly. To do that one must learn patience, self-control and focus that cannot deviate otherwise you'll have to start, all over. Martial arts training teaches a similar concept in their art of learning as does most crafts. That is why it can be said that the true power and limits of what a sorcerer is capable of can be observed in his preparations undergone before his casting of a spell. The most powerful wizards that have ever been all have this one trait in common, they all have the messiest workplaces you will, ever find anywhere, with books and scrolls scattered about like whirlwind just blew through. 3. Decide if timing is important in some traditions, moon phase is crucial, while in others it's not significant. Generally, positive magic, or workings that draw things to you, is performed during the waxing moon. Negative or destructive magic is done during the waning phase. It may be that you feel a certain day of the week is best for the working, or even a certain hour of the day. Don't feel obligated to drown yourself in the details, 
though. If you're a person who feels confident doing magic on the fly without worrying about timing, then go for it. Be sure to check our magical correspondence tables if correspondences make a difference in your tradition. 4. Figure out your wording what words, or incantation, if any, will be verbalized during the working. Are you going to chant something formal and powerful, calling upon the gods for assistance? Will you simply mutter a poetic couplet under your breath? Or is it the sort of working where you can simply ponder the universe in silence? Remember, there is power in words, so select them carefully. 5. Make it happen put all of the above, together into a workable form, and then, in the immortal words of the Nike commercial, just do it. Llewellyn author Susan Pesznecker says of crafting a spell on your own, when you build a spell yourself, from the ground up, you infuse it with your deliberateness, your preferences, your wishes, your thoughts, and your energies. This spell won't simply be something you read from someone else's pages, it will carry your own signature and resonate through your very core. It will be much more powerful and complete than any ready-made charm could ever be, making you an integral part of the magic from start to finish. When we practice spellcraft, we use magic as a way of altering reality. We do this by working with as many of the corresponding realities as possible, time, date, place, elemental correspondences, the support of deities, etc in hopes that we can shift reality in one direction or the other and alter the outcome. Nowhere is this more elegantly done than in handcrafting spells, charms, and rituals, because in these instances, we put our essence into the magic and make it our own. In comparison magic is the ancient forgotten form of quantum science, molecular and geological as well as biological science along with astrology all rolled into one generalized cultural art. Tips, despite the above five-step method being a very bare bones and simple way of looking at spell construction, it does work effectively. You may wish to keep a magical journal or make notes in your book of shadows during the spell construction phase, and then keep track of results as they begin to manifest. If a spell hasn't begun to manifest effects within a few weeks, some traditions say within 28 days, a lunar month, you may want to stop and revisit the spell. Figure out what variables may need to be changed. The universe has a quirky sense of humor and can be compared to being bipolar most of the time with that bipolar shift relying much off each time on aspects of cause and effect, so make sure anything you cast a spell for is worded correctly. In other words, be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. And keep in mind the rule of three that any spell you cast that is of self-assurial intent will return upon you threefold in effect and is a rule of cosmic balance that governs that rule. So be mindful when using the force. Remember that magic is a tool and a skill set, but some common sense should prevail as well. You can cast all day to get yourself a job, but your chances of success are greatly reduced if you haven't pounded the pavement and sent out copies of your resume.